They sang their ganas and played their dhuns or music within the confines of their cramped accommodation. In the stillness of night, music from the sitar, sarangi, dholak, dhantal and basuri would fill the air as they petitioned their only links with a distant homeland. Already we've seen parts of that historical journey and the circumstances that led to the arrival of indentured immigrants from India to Trinidad and Tobago. Well, as you know, one of the conditions under which they came was to work for five years under a system of paid contract labor, albeit for 24 cents per day, after which they would be given a return passage back home. But that did not go as planned. The general pattern was that the more the colonial powers understood that the Indians were here to stay, most of them, the less were the incentives to stay. So initially, if you re-indented yourself for an additional period of five years, and therefore you saved the British Treasury the expense of having to repatri repatriate you to India, you were given five pounds and five acres of land. Later on, you could be given five pounds and ten acres of land. After a time, the money incentive was totally removed and you could get five acres of land. After a time, the Indian had to contribute to his or her own return to India. So the conditions varied. Nelson Island is an old fortress replete with various stages of Trinidad's history. The British captured it from the Spaniards in 1797. African slaves constructed its first major building in 1802. And between 1865 to 1917, it was used as a quarantine for the immigrants because the colonial hospital in Port of Spain was complaining that the disease-bearing coolies were occupying crucial bed space at the institution. Across from Nelson is Lenigan Island, which housed a hospital built especially to accommodate disease-bearing immigrants, many of whom died and were cremated here not out of a sense of respect, but because it was impossible to dispose of the dead in the stony grounds. Ironically, cremation of the Indian dead was not permitted in mainland Trinidad until 1946. However, it was here on Nelson Island that the new arrivals bonded and exchanged stories and shared cultural differences. That bond transcended the divisions of caste and religion. On evenings, as the sun began to set, they'd sit under the trees and sing their songs hoping that the calm waters of the ocean would transmit to their loved ones at home the pains of their loneliness and despair. The small percentages of those eager to return to families in India were quarantined on Nelson Island before repatriation. Invariably, existing conditions in India and the difficulty associated with re-entering Indian society because of the caste system forced many of them to return to Trinidad. Some of them even came to know that they belong to the upper caste in the ships, on the ships, or when they landed here. To me it seems that some of the people who even belong to the upper caste found their conditions helpless in India for one reason or the other. It may be economic, it may be social, and here was an alternative. But we have to keep one thing more in mind. They were going as an endangered labor. They thought that they might return after five years. Now, there was a fear of social, uh, social, you may say, boycott once they return. But more important was survival. Once they could survive, for five years, once they could live outside their own society, that was also an important issue at that time. 
Between 1869 to 1880, many ex-indentured immigrants benefited from a short-lived land commutation scheme. During that short period, quite a lot of ex-indentured immigrants got grants of five or perhaps in a few cases ten acres of crown lands in lieu of commutation. That meant they had to sign a little piece of paper saying they gave up their rights of repatriation. Um, so a relatively small number of ex-indentured Indians were granted free grants of crown land. The acreage was, I believe, about 19,000 acres. Much of the land was pretty bad land. It was marginal or difficult to cultivate. Um, the great majority of ex-indentured Indians who acquired land did so not through free grants, but through purchase. In 1869, at exactly the same time the commutation scheme began, the government in Trinidad opened up the crown lands for sale in relatively small portions. Previously, you'd had to buy huge blocks, which meant nobody except wealthy capitalists could. But from 1869, it was possible to purchase five or ten acres of crown land at reasonable prices. And um, as a result, many thousands of ex-indentured Indians and many thousands of Trinidadians of other ethnic groups purchased crown land. Um, so it was mainly through the purchase and leasing of land that Indians acquired real estate property. Some settled within close proximity of the sugarcane fields and factories and continued to work on the estates. Others became their own zamindars or landowners and began hiring freed immigrants to work for them, growing food crops and vegetables cultivating sugar cane, reaping cocoa and coffee, and rearing animals. With the passage of time, they'd purchase more land. These concepts of thrift and sacrifice resulted from adversity and hardships of plantation life. They pinched at their earnings to purchase only what they did not produce from the land. Oftentimes, they were regarded as penurious or stingy, but were in fact saving for the proverbial rainy day. By 1884, some of them had accumulated appreciable savings from their meager estate earnings. Gradually, they began acquiring wealth and applied to their inheritances the raw skills of peasantry and dharmic devotion to the land. They reclaimed swamps, cleared forests, and constructed houses of mud walls and patch roofs that seemed simple, yet with sound economic principles that reflected their culture of frugality. Rosilac area was made up of, of Indians who had migrated from other parts of Trinidad to Rosilac in the Oropuch Lagoon, um, where, where such land was being made available. The wealthier among the immigrants demonstrated a greater ambition and acquired instead of thatch roof, galvanized coverings to secure their houses. For the first time since arrival in 1845, they really enjoyed privacy and space to raise families. Slowly they began to express more openly, albeit with considerable official resistance, their rich cultural traditions, whether in dance, the music of their forefathers that kept burning in their hearts, or the songs that would subliminally transport them back to Mother India in times of despair and desperation. As the system of indentureship continued, new shiploads of Girmitias or agreement signers would arrive from different parts of the Indian subcontinent, bringing their own customs and traditions and adding to the opulent repository of time-honored rituals, festivals, and ceremonies. What are some of these customs and traditions, and how have they survived in cosmopolitan Trinidad and Tobago? How have the immigrants fared in an environment unkind and unfriendly, and sometimes even hostile? The pioneering Indian stepped off the ship and onto this land of a brighter tomorrow with anticipation. They brought almost no material possession, except a jahaji bundle of clothing, 
some musical instruments.